Hey, are, are, are we set up to start streaming? We're good? Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, hi. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Fong Bao Lin, and uh, I'm the current uh, CAPS board chairman. And uh, thank you very much to join us under this weather. Okay. And also, uh, first I'd like to, uh, it's, it is our honor to co-organize this uh, uh, lecture with Queen's College and uh, have uh, President Wu to give us this uh, uh, speech. I appreciate very much all the organizing uh, team members for their effort and time to make this speech possible. And uh, President Wu, he has a lot of experience in, in civil rights issues. He has lots of information to share with us today. I believe all of, of us will benefit a lot from his lecture. And thank you for coming and for your participations online. Uh, have a great Saturday, and thank you a lot. Thanks again. Yeah. And also, I'm going to, uh, our uh, president, uh, George, the current president of, of CAPS, uh, uh, George, he's going to introduce uh, President Wu, please. Good morning, friends in the house and online. My name is George Chen. I'm the Dean of Science and Technology at King University, CAPS 2022 president. It is with great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, President Frank H. Wu. Frank Wu was named president of Queens College City University of New York in June 2020. 
Prior to his presidency, he served as chancellor and dean, distinguished professor at UC Hastings College of Law. He was the dean of Wayne State University Law School at Detroit, his hometown. He was a member of faculty for a decade at Howard University, the nation's leading historically black university where he earned tenure. He was the first Asian American to serve in all these positions that he held. President Wu is a scholar, blogger, commentator to newspapers, journals, and TV programs. Just to name a few of his work, he authored Yellow, Race in America Beyond Black and White. He is the co-author of Race, Rights, and Reparation, Law and ja the Japanese American Internment, which received the single greatest grant from the Civil Liberty Public Education Fund. He is dedicated to civil engagement and volunteer service. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to our distinguished speaker, President Frank H. Wu. Good morning, friends. Welcome to Queens College, to our beautiful campus as we emerge from the pandemic and as our students return in full force. It's an honor. I am truly humbled to be asked by CAPS to deliver this talk, not only for the audience gathered here in Lefrac Auditorium, part of our Aaron Copeland School of Music. We're launching a new art school here at Queens College this year because the Aaron Copeland School, which is at the heart of it, is internationally renowned. I'm humbled because I know that my family uh, has uh, worked with CAPS uh, for decades and uh, my late uncle Wu Jing uh, is well known to many in the audience uh, and uh, it was uh, just so touching when CAPS contacted me to invite me to give this speech about Asian Americans as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. For the viewers at home streaming, we do uh, have a PowerPoint presentation. It's available here on the screen. I'll be clicking through it uh, with uh, this uh, device here. And I hope to engage you on some of the most difficult, sometimes controversial and contentious issues of this diverse democracy of ours. And I know that people have different opinions. And I want to start by saying I respect that. It's so important for us to form our, our own views. That's what we try to do here as we educate the next generation to develop critical thinking. What I'd like to do is present to you some of the history and facts that are not as well known, even to Asian Americans ourselves. Because one of the questions that we so often are asked, and perhaps ask ourselves, is how do we fit in? This nation beckon with freedom and opportunity the world over. I know that when my parents came in the early 1960s as scholarship students, perhaps like many of you or your parents, that this was the proverbial American dream. My father explained to me that when he grew up, he and his brothers, well, at dinner they would have a bowl of rice, a stalk of a vegetable, some tofu, and a morsel of meat, just a small amount. They weren't vegetarians, but uh, meat was more of a condiment because it was scarce and expensive. And he came here and discovered as a, a middle-class person, you didn't have to be rich, you could order an eight ounce steak. Now you couldn't go do that every day on special occasions. So when I was growing up in the American Midwest in the 1970s, we sometimes would go to one of those chain steakhouses, you know, with the salad bar uh, and, and that sort of thing. And, and that was uh, just so much a realization for my parents that they had made it because an eight ounce steak would have been as much meat as a family of four would have consumed in a week, perhaps a month, back where they had grown up. And for me then, coming to this role at Queens College, this is my American dream, a dream job. I'm coming full circle in some sense. I know I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the power of American higher education. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about how Asian Americans fit in. Let's get started. So this talk is entitled 
Asian Americans at a crossroads. During the past couple of years, the word unprecedented has become almost a cliche. None of us has experienced anything like what we've been through, yet none of us has experienced the opportunity to rebuild. If I had shown up on this campus or anywhere else before this pandemic and said, you know, let's start again. Let's envision a, a world anew. People would have said, no, no thanks, we're, we're fine with what we have now. But unprecedented can have a positive meaning too. This sense that a diverse democracy, a unique experiment in self-governance, that here we can do something unlike uh, is done anywhere else. Oh, I think we have a sign language interpreter as well. Uh, Let's uh, welcome our sign language interpreter. Let's wait one minute. I, I know a little bit of ASL. Good, thank you. Something All right. Uh, let's see. We need you in the light, though, for this, right? So, uh, <laughs> oh, you're, you're getting applause. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out for those who are watching. Sorry, this is not good for you because I just signed my name. <laughs> all right. Uh, that, that's about all the, the sign language I, I know. I, I learned it because I was a trustee of Gallaudet University, the unique school for the deaf and hard of hearing. And so I felt it very important to, to learn a little bit of sign language. I, I can talk about that during Q&A if uh, there's interest. So let's take a look here. We talk about race, we think about race. Race is all around us, even if we're not aware of it, and so often we use a black-white paradigm. What I mean by that is we assume everyone fits neatly into one of two boxes and only two boxes, either you're black or you're white. So let me give you some examples of this. In the center is a photograph. Uh, this is from the, the year I was born, 1967. So if uh, you remember America in 1967, it was a long, hot summer. It was a long, hot summer of unrest. It could be called a riot or rebellion, depending on your perspective, but in city after city after city, places such as Detroit, my hometown, Newark, places such as Chicago or Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles, either that summer or a couple summers before the summer after, and city after city after city, you saw scenes such as this. This is, this is a real photo from back then, where the National Guard or the United States Army would have to be called in, and armored personnel carriers would roll down major thoroughfares such as Woodward Avenue in the Motor City. And the cities burned. This caused so much concern, understandably, that the federal government put together a commission. It was called the Kerner Commission. There was a fellow named Otto Kerner. He was the governor of the state of Illinois, and on the left is the report that they published, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. So President Lyndon Baines Johnson asked Governor Kerner and a blue ribbon bipartisan panel to, to look into matters. And it's an unusual document for a government report for it concludes that America is not one nation, it is instead two nations, two nations, black and white, that's the title of the best-selling book on the right uh, by a fellow named Andrew Hacker. Uh, professor Hacker is in his 90s, and he's a professor right here at Queens College. I knew his book uh, that he wrote more than a generation ago, and uh, it was uh, just wonderful to, to come to know him. Uh, his book is an erudite, thoughtful study of race, and he borrowed his title, Two Nations, from the Kerner Report, Black and White, Separate, Hostile, and unequal. Now, that's one framing. And when I was in college, I wanted to write a term paper about Asian Americans and civil rights. That's how my book first started. So this is back in 1984, I started college, if you can imagine. I'm 55 this year, but, but I'm Asian, so you can't tell, right? <laughs> that's the joke that they, they have. Well, I went to the library, and I looked in the card catalog. That's another sign of age, right? People today just Google it, so young people don't remember a card catalog, uh, but there was a room the size of a football field, right, with these cabinets that had these very long drawers you'd pull out, and there'd be a card for every book. Actually, three cards. It would be indexed by author, by title, by subject. 
Well, why am I explaining this to you? Because back then I thought I would research Asian Americans and civil rights. So I went to, to find a book about Asian Americans and civil rights and there weren't any. There was no such book. So I thought, well, maybe I'll read about race. For, for you see, the book didn't exist. The library that I was working from was at a, a fancy uh, East Coast University. It was a good research institution. So they weren't missing the book, it just didn't exist. So I uh, gathered dozens of books about race and I started to look at them. And I realized it didn't matter whether they were old or new, whether they were by liberals or conservatives, thick or thin, even though the dust jacket to the book said, this is all about race, it covers everything. I would read a few pages and the author would explain that they were using a black-white paradigm, that they assumed everyone was either black or white. And as I strolled across campus or walked down the sidewalk, I realized the book was wrong. It was just inaccurate, right? It was leaving out people who were Hispanic, or uh, Latinx is the term uh, that we started to use these days, L Latino. It would leave out Asian Americans. It would leave out Native Americans. It would leave out people of mixed ancestry because this monochromatic view uh, put everyone into just two boxes. So I decided to, to challenge that. Uh, not out of ethnic pride, mind you. I wanted to write a term paper that earned an A. So I thought, well, you want to start with a picture of the world that's accurate. And that means seeing that there are so many people as here in Queens, the world's borough. That's why I'm thrilled to, to be here, because it is apparent in Queens if you exit our campus, or if you even stay on our campus, where more than 100 languages are in use at the homes of our students, you realize the world is not literally black and white. Now, uh, for my friends, and I'll explain this as we go through the talk, part of my goal is to show how introducing non-black people of color, minority communities, actually helps it doesn't harm the historic struggle for black equality and the debt that we all owe uh, to the great civil rights movement. So I came across the work eventually of a uh, scholar, W.E.B. Du Bois, and I want to acknowledge his work. Uh, you know the name if you've ever studied race, and you know some of what he talked about even if you've never heard the name. Du Bois was what was called back in the day a race man. He was a founder of the NAACP. Born during the Reconstruction era after the United States Civil War, he lived all the way to the eve of Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington, D.C. in 1963. And uh, Du Bois was uh, among so many other uh, distinctions, the first African American to have earned a doctorate at Harvard in the field of sociology when it was new. He wrote essays and plays and newspaper columns. He was an advocate. Uh, and in 1903, he wrote a book, this one, The Souls of Black Folk. I commend it to you. In it, he talks about what does it mean to be talked about by others as a problem, as the Negro problem, as it was referred to then. He discusses dual identity, being a hyphenated American, being American through and through, yet indelibly black and denigrated as such. This is well before anyone else was talking about these issues. He had his theory of the talented tenth, that those who would achieve great success had not only rights, but responsibilities to help lift up others. You could not doubt for a moment then that W.E.B. Du Bois was committed to the uplift of a race. And I want to call out a particular quote and, and lift it up for you, uh, because this you've seen. Students sometimes write papers for me on the subject of race and civil rights, and they quote Du Bois. They, they quote this line, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Now remember, he's writing in 1903. He was profound and prescient. He predicted accurately at the dawn of a new century. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Yet whenever a student turns in a paper to me with that quote, I realize they haven't actually read the essay. Because if you go back and find that passage, that's not even half the words in the sentence. Du Bois continues, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa and America and the islands of the sea. Now those words are just as important. Why? because it shows that Du Bois, as committed, as passionate as he was 
about advancing the equality of African Americans during a time of Jim Crow de jure racial segregation, he situated that struggle globally, universally. He thought that the problem of the color line had to do with the men of Asia and Africa, the Americas, and the islands of the sea. So it turns out, you know, when you're in college, you have this conceit. Every idea you think of is, is yours. You, you thought it up yourself, right? And so my idea of race beyond black and white, it's not my idea at all. This is the project initiated by W.E.B. Du Bois that we help everyone, that these are universal principles, that this is not self-interest. So I want to, to uh, lift up for you W.E.B. Du Bois and acknowledge my own intellectual debt uh, to his uh, path-breaking work. So when I say race is not literally black and white, let me give you an example of what I mean. So uh, these are just some statistics. Um, this is already out of date. When I first did this talk, the slide said there are about 18 million Asian Americans, and then the census came out, and I revised it to about 20 million. Uh, it's more than 20 million because Asian Americans are the single fastest growing uh, racial uh, category in the United States. And we show you here the uh, national origins, the spectacular growth of the population, uh, and then here's a little uh, pie chart that gives you a sense of uh, where people are from, because Asian American is an artificial category, of course. Uh, sometimes I say there are no Asians in Asia. People are puzzled by that. What I mean is in Asia, of course, people identify much more specifically. They're Chinese, they're Japanese, they're Indian, they're Pakistani, right? They're Korean, they're Filipino. They identify by province, by dialect. They identify by clan. Uh, if you walk the streets of Shanghai or Seoul or Saigon, very few people will say that they're Asian, right? They'll give you a very different answer. So this is just to show you that uh, what I'm trying to do is describe the world, offer a picture of the world that is more accurate than a framing that's just black and white. And of course, right here in Flushing, in Queens, it's hard to believe today, but I meet some of our older alumni who remember uh, when they came to school here, they were the first Filipino family on the block, for example. Because if you go back not that long, some of you might recall, not that long ago, if you go back certainly 50 years ago, there were a few people of Asian descent, a smattering, but nothing like what you see now. And 25 years ago, when Flushing, well, it wasn't considered the most vibrant and dynamic part of New York City. Well, what happened? Immigrants came. Asian immigrants came. And they revitalized downtown Flushing uh, in a way that could not be imagined that you have to see to believe. So this is just the empirical reality. 20 million plus Asian Americans. And in places such as Flushing, Queens, uh, they're the entrepreneurs. They're the owners of the restaurants and other small businesses that are the backbone of this economy. But Asian Americans uh, have been here longer than that and have been allies. I said I wanted to show a little bit about how Asian Americans can help and have helped African Americans in the struggle for equality and vice versa. I, I'll explain a little bit of each of these. Let's take a look at the photo in the center. This is from Life Magazine. If uh, you remember Life, you know, kids today don't remember Life Magazine, so I explain it was like the Instagram of its time period, right? It was one of the major American uh, uh, news magazines, but it used pictures to tell stories. That is uh, Malcolm X. He's been shot. He's been assassinated. The, the case has been in the news uh, recently. And he's dying. It's 1965. This is the Audubon Ballroom in New York City. Look at this photo with care. Do you see this woman just above him cradling his head? She's not some random passerby. No, that's Yuri Kochiyama, one of his closest confidants uh, and associates. She's Japanese-American. She was a homemaker who was inspired by reading about Malcolm X and what he was doing, uh, and she joined him. Here she is later in life, giving the Black Power salute. So that's just one example. Let's turn to this image here. 
in the lower right. Uh, that's the Japanese American Citizens League, founded in 1929. Well, they're holding a banner and they're dressed in their Sunday best because they're about to, to go off to march with Dr. King. The JACL had an internal debate about whether uh, to join uh, Dr. King there under the hot sun in, in D.C. where he delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech, and they decided they had to be there. And this is the photographic proof of their delegation uh, prepared to, to head off. Uh, over here, we have Grace Lee Boggs uh, and her husband James Boggs, uh, radical uh, labor leaders, uh, Grace Boggs, made it uh, to her 100th birthday. Uh, they organized workers in Detroit, my hometown. This is just an example. I said I, I wanted to mention, too, how uh, Asian immigrants owe a debt to African Americans. Well, you know, during the presidency of Lyndon Baines Johnson, that's the Great Society era, when America was confident, it was optimistic, uh, despite the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, president Johnson, uh, vice president, uh, assumed the presidency and passed bill after bill after bill that made America what it is today. If you visit his presidential library in Austin, Texas, it's so impressive. On the first floor are all the pieces of legislation uh, that he shepherded through and the fountain pens used to, to sign those bills. Well, among them, among the most important, were the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which made real the equality that we take for granted, that you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of their race or their national origin or their religion. And then the 1965 Immigration Act, that's the one that finally eliminated the racial restrictions that kept people who look like so many of us in this auditorium from ever coming. Those two pieces of legislation are related they come from the same spirit, the same spirit uh, that President Kennedy, uh, before President Johnson, had spoken of. They're uh, part of a uh, sense that, that America, as great as it is, has more work to do to live up to its ideals. And so the 64 Civil Rights Act made possible the 65 Immigration Act. So without the advocacy by African Americans and without the desire to ensure equality for African Americans primarily, but for all peoples through that legislation, Asian immigrants wouldn't even have been allowed to come. So this allyship is reciprocal. Uh, take a look at this photo. This is uh, as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King prepares to march in uh, Selma. And look at what he's wearing. That's a lay. Uh, other than uh, the, the nun, all of the folks whose arms are linked here in the front have fresh Hawaiian lays. Now, this is remarkable. Why? Because remember, Hawaii had entered the Union only in 1959. This is before easy jet travel. There's no such thing as overnight delivery. Uh, so to get Hawaiian lays from Hawaii to the Deep South and for them to reach Dr. King, that was no easy feat. It was done by a, a fellow member of the cloth, uh, an Asian American clergyman uh, who wanted to show solidarity. And Dr. King uh, and uh, his delegation, they all put on these lays. So these are some photos that show that back in the day, in, those, in that storied era, when the great civil rights advances were made uh, against violent backlash and massive resistance that African Americans and Asian Americans worked together. There are so many parts of history that people don't talk about. The Oxnard beat strike, uh, uh, we don't have time to talk about that, you can Google it. Uh, but if you look at this history, Asian Americans were there and Asian Americans worked with African Americans, Latinos, and others. In fact, Asian Americans go back uh, to the very uniting of the nation. So in many history textbooks these days, there's a line that says the Transcontinental Railroad, the western half of it was built by Chinese immigrants, 10 to 15,000 men. And people may know that, but they, they don't know much else. Um, let me explain a little bit about why this is so important. So the Civil War had just concluded and historians will tell you, you can just look at the grammar 
and you can tell the United States was not united. Do you know why? The United States back then was referred to as a plural. So if you're going to talk about how beautiful the land was, you would have said the United States are beautiful, which to the modern era, that sounds a little funny because now the United States is a singular. We would say the United States is beautiful. It's a beautiful nation. But back then, because the nation was so divided, it was spoken of in the plural, right? And if you wanted to travel from New York City, Boston, or Philadelphia to San Francisco or Los Angeles. Now remember, San Francisco and Los Angeles were frontier towns then, but if you wanted to go there or Portland or Seattle, you faced a perilous overland journey of weeks, not just days, weeks. Or uh, you had to sail for weeks or months, right? So the United States was not united, and there was this idea of manifest destiny. Now I, I know, and I have in quotes here, many are, are quite critical, manifest destiny was the idea that white Christian European settlers uh, would exercise dominion over this continent. But uh, let's return to how Asian Americans were involved, because if it weren't for the Chinese laborers, the Transcontinental Railroad wouldn't have been built. <laughs> it wouldn't have succeeded. It was the largest infrastructure project of its time. It was speculative. People didn't think it could be done. But there were crews working from the East Coast westward and the West Coast eastward. They met at a desolate place called Promontory Point, Utah. You can still go out there. It's still a desolate place. And they drove the Golden Spikes. So this photo in the center, this black and white photo, it's a fascinating photo. It's, it's one of a whole set of images. If you were an educated person back then, you would have known this photo. This was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. It's a golden spike ceremony, festive. It's a party, it's raucous. Uh, the railroad barons, sometimes called the robber barons, uh, those four, uh, made a fortune, and uh, they, they shook hands, the locomotives uh, came together, and the United States was one. Well, you know, this photo, now I know even on this screen, it's not that big, but you can look it up or any of the photos uh, from that period. And here's something very interesting about that party. Now remember, the entire Western half, 90% or more of the workforce was of Chinese descent. They were lowered in these wicker baskets and blasted their way through sheer granite rock face. They lost life and limb. That's where that uh, insulting phrase, a Chinaman's chance comes from, right? Meaning very low odds of success. Why? Because sometimes these men who had dynamite, a new technology, highly volatile, weren't lifted up by their compatriots up at the top fast enough and the explosion would go off and they would die. Well, so they sacrificed, they built the western half, but in this photo, they're not there. This is symbolic exclusion, which leads to literal exclusion. You can blow up this photo however big. You won't find a single Asian face. And you can blow up all the photos from that series. There aren't any Asian people, though they built the whole Western half. So you can see right here this documentation of what was thought of uh, the Asian immigrants. They were an expendable workforce. Well, you know, there's a fellow named Corky Lee. Very sadly, he passed away during the COVID-19 pandemic. Corky was a Queens College alum. And uh, some years back, he decided he wanted photographic justice. So he organized the descendants here of these railroad workers. So these folks are sixth, seventh, eighth generation of Chinese descent, many mixed, and they would trek all the way out. They'd make a pilgrimage to Promontory Point, Utah, and they would restage the Golden Spike ceremony with uh, themselves in the photo, representing their ancestors, those men who had sacrificed so much. At the 100th anniversary, the centennial of uh, the Transcontinental Railroad completion, when that ceremony was held, the actor John Wayne was due to appear, so they bumped the lone Chinese-American speaker from the program uh, to make room for John Wayne. At the 150th, the sesquicentennial, I was on to have been there in 2019, uh, that was remedied. There were Chinese-American speakers, and at long last, they were acknowledged. So... Uh, this presence goes back even before then. You know, I'll share with you something. So I, I am, even as a president, I still like to think of myself as a scholar. I study this history, and there's so much to learn. I did not know 
about this part of history until I came across this book, Asians and Pacific Islanders and the Civil War. That's the United States Civil War. To refresh your recollection, that was fought between 1861 and 1865. And when I first saw this book, I thought, wow, is that possible? I've shown uh, this book to some people, and they've said, no. Which Civil War? The, the Chinese Civil War? No, no, the United States Civil War. This is a real photo. This, this fellow was adopted. And what happened was the National Park Service, they went back through and looked at the rosters of the Union and Confederate armies. And you know what they found? Not one, not two, not dozens. They found hundreds I want to say this clearly. They found hundreds of Asian immigrant soldiers serving in the Union and Confederate armies from China, from Japan, from the Philippines, from places you couldn't have imagined, and they were there in the 1860s before the Transcontinental Railroad. So this history is only now being rediscovered, yet they were driven out. This is one of uh, three books written about this time period. Entire towns were burned down. This is Rock Springs, Wyoming. Uh, there was arson, there was shooting, there was lynching. In Los Angeles in 1871, for example, one out of 10 of the Chinese residents was killed in a single 24-hour time period. 10% of the population wiped out in one day. And that history uh, is not typically taught. That's what I want to restore to the curriculum to explain, uh, in part to establish that Asian Americans, yes, they continue to come and we should welcome newcomers, but not all Asian Americans are newcomers. Some can trace their roots here all the way back to the 1860s. There are even Asian Americans whose ancestors came on the Mayflower. Now, when I say that, people are skeptical. They say, that can't be, that's absurd. It's because of intermarriage, right? They're Anglo-Asians. I actually uh, know a few people like this uh, who could belong to the Daughters of the American Revolution, D-A-R, one of those blue blood groups uh, with exclusive membership. You have to show that during the colonial era, your ancestors were here. Well, if you trace their ancestry on one side of the family, it goes all the way back to that time period. So what is it that uh, contributes to these images of Asian Americans? I'm going to talk about two. The first is the model minority myth. Now, some people have heard this term, but even people who haven't know it. It's this idea that Asian Americans are super successful. Whiz kids, rocket scientists, child prodigies, right? It's the idea that I can do calculus in my head. I must have gotten a perfect SAT score and gone off to college at the age of 11, right? It's the, the hardworking, polite, quiet image uh, that Asian Americans, they've made it. Now, uh, this sounds like a compliment, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how it's dangerous. Now, when I do that, I, I always have to explain. Those who have succeeded, I applaud them. They deserve our respect, so don't get me wrong. This includes many of you in this room. You came with nothing but ambition and your smarts, and you were willing to work, and you made it. I commend you, I respect you, I bow before you. Those are people like my parents, people like my uncles and aunts. Yet, I wonder about this image, the image that all Asians have made it. And I'm going to explain why I'm a little bit troubled by it. There are four reasons, really. Let me start with the first. Um, sometimes people say, why can't you just accept a compliment? You know, why can't you just accept when people say, oh, you Asians, you're you're good at math and science, right? I'm not particularly good at math and science, that's why I had to become a lawyer, right? Well, here's reason number one. Um, people don't know this, but income equality among Asian Americans is astonishing. Asian American income equality is greater than for any other racial group, including blacks. Now, how can that be? Well, some of you are trained and have a statistical background or social science background. It's because Asian immigration to the United States fits a bimodal curve. Now you might think, what is a bimodal curve? Really easy. It's a camel with two humps, not a camel with one. So well, what does this depict? This depicts socioeconomic status, all right? 
uh, this is just a, an abstract image, right? So what do you have? You have, yes, high net worth folks, ultra high net worth folks, right? We read about them in the New York Times on the society page. They arrive with $10 million cash and buy a condominium right uh, downtown. They're even building condos like that in Flushing, right? Uh, they're uh, transnational elite. They're folks who are investors, right? They're sending their sons and daughters here uh, and so on, uh, as well as people who are middle class, right? And maybe they don't have a lot of money, but they have human capital. They already have an MD or PhD, right? But they can earn much more money here. That's how you get a green card with those skills. What's the other hump? Well, folks we don't talk about. They're the people who were uh, on the Golden Venture. Remember that? Uh, a generation ago, that's the ship uh, that was being brought by the snakehead smuggling operations that ran aground. They're undocumented. They're rideshare drivers. They work at the all-you-can-eat seafood buffet. Um, these folks are, of course, cousins, distant cousins, perhaps, right? But cousins, right? Maybe from neighboring provinces. So when we talk about Asian Americans as the model minority, what we do is we leave out this entire part of the population. We focus just on those who are well-to-do. And we don't realize that this is brain drain. It's selective migration, right? Um, even now, it's difficult to get from Asia to the United States. And so people who look at this will tell you that immigrants tend to be different than their family members they left behind. Right? Uh, let me praise you. You tend to be more ambitious. That's how you got here. Right? Some biologists have even studied this, and this is less true now since you can get on an airplane, but it used to be that immigrants generally were healthier. They were bigger. Why? Because they had to make it from inland to a coastal uh, city, to a port, to sail, and that was arduous. Some people didn't survive. So immigrants uh, in general... Uh, are uh, better situated uh, than those uh, whom they leave behind. So the first uh, concern that I have about the model minority myth is uh, that it ignores the selective nature of most migration. This, by the way, isn't just true of Asian Americans. If you look at migration from Africa or migration from so many other places, uh, there uh, is uh, more than one wave coming at the same time. The second reason that I worry about the model minority myth is it whitewashes, whitewashes bias. When you talk about it, people say, what are you complaining about? You're all rich anyway, right? Uh, it allows people to say Asian Americans have got no problems. So even if Asian Americans complain, even if they face documented, demonstrated bias and discrimination, people brush it off. Oh, it's not that bad. Come on, you're the model minority. You're not like other minorities. You got no problems. Well, here's a study by a friend of mine, Buck G. This appeared in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, it's a statistical study, and it's of Silicon Valley, where you would think Asian Americans, if you believe the stereotype, are doing really well. Asian Americans are the least likely group in the United States to be promoted to management. The least likely. I'll just offer you a personal example. You know, I'm uh, very much honored to be here as president of Queens College. I'm the first Asian American uh, president uh, of Queens College. Uh, my friend David Wu was appointed at our sister institution, Baruch College. We started the same day back in 2020, and we're the first two Asian Americans ever appointed in the City University of New York system to head one of its institutions. That's remarkable because Asian Americans are reputed to succeed, especially in the academic sector, but you can look at it statistically. At every level from dean up, Asian Americans are underrepresented, not overrepresented. There are fewer Asian American deans, provosts, presidents, chancellors, and board members than you would expect. Yet what happens when you talk about the bamboo ceiling, as some have called it? People say, yeah, you're all rich. It's the crazy rich Asians image. So that, that's the second concern that I have about this model minority myth. The third is, that it ratchets up racial resentment, that the model minority myth is actually a cause of anger, right? Think of it this way. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my parents sometimes would, uh, well, they would compare me to the kids of, uh, of their friends. And they'd say, why, why can't you be more like Johnny? 
And, you know, that would just make me resentful and want to go punch Johnny in the nose, which I think is a normal human reaction. What do you think uh, people, not just other people of color, but whites think when they read that Asian Americans are earning more money or succeeding or doing better or taking over or uh, overrepresented uh, on college campuses. It leads to this idea, as Ronald Takaki once said, we're punished for our virtues rather than our vices. Well, let me give you some specific examples. This is a pamphlet. It's written by a fellow named Samuel Gompers, published in 1902, this version. It was published repeatedly by the Asiatic Exclusion League. You know, this is before the internet, it's before television, it's before radio. This is back when if you wanted to get your point across, you stood on a street corner, you gave a speech, you handed out a pamphlet. What's this about? It says, Meat versus Rice, American Manhood Against Asiatic Coolism. This book, it's a short book, you, you can get it on, online, you can read it for yourself. It argues, it has a preposterous argument, but that's a, it's a metaphor, it argues that... Um, White people have to eat meat, Asians can subsist on rice, and that's unfair because meat costs more than rice. But the more general point uh, that Gompers, who was a progressive, respected labor leader that he wanted to make is Asians work hard. Now, that's the model minority myth. You're so hardworking. But what's another way to describe hardworking? Unfair competition, right? So what Gompers was saying, they work too hard. Every aspect of the model minority myth can be turned on its head. To be good at math and science, what's that mean? You have no people skills. You can't be a leader, right? To be polite, what does that mean? It means you're submissive, you're docile, right? Um, you can be taken advantage of. So my fear about the model minority myth is it makes people, such as this UCLA student, uh, this is as social media was just taking off. She posted a video about how all the Asians were taking over Right? It's the yellow peril image that Asians are too successful. So that's the third concern I have about the model minority myth, that um, it leads to this sense that Asian Americans are too hard working, that whites can't uh, win against Asian Americans, and that's a problem. The fourth concern, though, is it's false flattery. Sometimes it's not about Asian Americans at all. It's about other people of color. It's a way to say to African Americans and Asian Americans, look at the, the Asians. They're, they're good immigrants. They're good minorities. They made it. Why can't you? Using us as pawns uh, with a comparison that isn't appropriate, that ignores the different group histories and the different stereotypes. So those are the concerns that I have about the model minority myth. Again, let me repeat. It is wonderful that Asian Americans have succeeded. And I commend all those Asian Americans who are hardworking. I just worry that when it's turned into a racial generalization, especially when it's used for the sake of comparison, that it ignores the selective nature of migration, that it whitewashes bias, that it generates racial resentment, and that it's used uh, to, in an in invidious manner to divide rather than unite. There's another image of Asian Americans, though. It's the perpetual foreigner syndrome. You know, this is exemplified by the question, where are you really from? Now, again, as a lawyer, I always have a caveat or disclaimer with everything that I have to say. There's nothing wrong with asking people where you're from. I'm proud of where I'm from, right? And uh, we, we ask people all the time. You're at a cocktail party. You meet a friend of a friend. It's an icebreaker. Where, where are you from, right? It's a way that we situate people. And yet, when I say I'm from Detroit, people sometimes are puzzled. They furrow their brows. They say, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, where are you really from? And the addition of that one word speaks volumes. It says I'm a liar. It says I can't be an American. I can't define who I am. We don't run around asking everyone where they're really from, right? Try it sometime. Ask a native-born white American, and where are you really from? And people get flustered. They say, well, I just told you, right? I'm from Iowa. Uh, they take for granted uh, that they are able to define their own identity. There's nothing wrong with saying uh, you're uh, from China or Taiwan. Uh, my parents were born in China. They grew up in Taiwan. And that's how they would answer the question. Uh, but if I, when a stranger accosts me and says, where are you really from? say, finally, I confess China. Sometimes they say, oh, I thought so. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the end of the conversation, right? Or sometimes uh, they want to connect, not to me, but to an image they have in their heads. They say, oh, you know, I had a really good meal at a Chinese restaurant just last week. As if I should say, oh, thanks, I'll let the chef know the next time all of us Chinese folks get together. Or they want to tell me how they visited the Great Wall last year. They have in their head an image uh, that uh, I'm not an American. I can't be. That my heart belongs elsewhere. I might be a spy, a sleeper agent, someone carrying the COVID-19 virus, right? I'm going to show you how this isn't just about innocent questions. Now, uh, there's also nothing wrong with being from someplace else. That's what we celebrate. Uh, this book is about how um, many European immigrants of a century ago uh, migrated back and forth, round trip to America. They went back. This book um, by Charlotte Brooks, she teaches over uh, at Baruch, a part of the City University of New York, is about how Chinese Americans of a couple generations ago, born in the United States, faced such bias and discrimination, they left. Though they were American through and through, even New Yorkers, they just couldn't take it, and they sought their fortune overseas. So th during the pandemic, we saw so much of this violence. Maybe you should go back to China, where you belong, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about that as uh, we turn to contemporary events. The most obvious example of how this affects people is the internment of Japanese Americans, the incarceration, the imprisonment. 120,000 individuals, two-thirds of them native-born citizens of the United States, native-born, such as these kids pledging allegiance, such as this family. Or take a look at this fellow. He's being led away by military police. He put on his uniform. That's a United States military uniform. He actually outranks these fellows. And he fought for the United States in World War I, or what would be called the Great War. And as a result, under special legislation, he could have naturalized um, if he wasn't born in the United States. Uh, those uh, who served in the United States military, who were veterans, could become citizens, even though there was a racial bar that applied to Asians. Um, many of these photos were taken by Dorothea Lange. Uh, she was the great American photographer. Uh, her most famous image is of migrant mother. Uh, that's of the Dust Bowl era. You know, um, the photos are so sympathetic to their subject. She was commissioned by the United States government to go out there and take these photos. But uh, when her uh, supervisors looked at them, you know, this family, do these look like spies? Do they look like saboteurs? Do these look like folks loyal to Tokyo? or the people who perpetrated the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7th, 1941. Well, they look like them in the sense of color of skin, texture of hair, the shape of their eyes. But they're from Los Angeles. They love baseball. They've converted to Christianity. They speak English. Many of them have never been to Japan. They left it behind. So Dorothea Lange's supervisors looked at these photos. They were so sympathetic that they impounded them. They seized the negatives, and they didn't want them published. It wasn't until three generations later, thanks uh, to the archival research of a professor named Gary Okihiro, that the images uh, were finally uh, disseminated widely to the public, because this was an embarrassment. That's what happens. It leads with just where are you really from, but it culminates with a government policy to take people and men, women, children, the elderly, the disabled, United States military veterans, and on the basis of the theory, blood will tell that they are really more Japanese than American. They're to be locked up, their possessions seized, uh, fired from their jobs, their equality, their dignity taken away. Um, that, by the way, wasn't just because of Pearl Harbor. These sentiments existed. They were open uh, well before Pearl Harbor. Here's an image using a racial slur. Now, um, what's interesting about this image is this woman, who's white, she's not embarrassed at all. She has put a big sign on her house, right, um, because she wants to express her anger at her neighbors. Dr. Seuss, before he became Dr. Seuss, drew propaganda cartoons. These depict Japanese Americans receiving dynamite and spying in order to help Japan. Uh, 
he was known as Theodore Geisel then. Uh, some speculate uh, that his uh, children's book and the story of Horton Hears a Who is a, a uh, veiled apology for his World War II cartoons uh, that suggested not just that Japanese were the enemy, but that Japanese Americans, um, they're characterized as the fifth column, a term popularized from the Spanish Civil War for the enemy within, those who would commit treason. The Vincent Chin murder, I uh, could do an entire talk about this, I, I won't. In 1982 in Detroit, this is what set me on my course. Vincent Chin, Chinese American, 27 years old, working class kind of guy, not different than his killers, these two fellows, auto workers, one of them out of work. He was about to be married, and uh, what's important is this happened uh, at the height of a recession in the Motor City, where everyone made cars. That's why I grew up there. My father was an engineer. If all the Asian immigrant engineers vanished, well, you know, the American auto industry would have collapsed. And some of us in this room are old enough to remember everyone drove an American car back then. Rich people might have had a Mercedes, and hippies might have had a Volkswagen, but no one drove what they used to call Jap crap. Right? It wasn't patriotic. People would make fun of you. They would let the air out of your tires, throw a cinder block through the windshield of your brand new vehicle if you parked it in your driveway. It wasn't made in the Motor City. Well, this fellow, Vincent Chin, salt of the earth. He was about to settle down, and uh, he wasn't a saint. He was just a normal guy. He went to, to a strip club for a bachelor's party, as guys will, will do with some buddies of his. And uh, these two fellows looked over at Chin, you have to pardon the language, but they called him a chink, they called him a jap, they called him a nip. You don't even hear that term anymore. And uh, according to witnesses, again, I'm sorry to use this language, but it's so important because uh, it explains what was going on here. They said to him, you little motherfucker, because you motherfuckers were out of work. Meaning that never mind that he was of Chinese descent, not Japanese. He was an American, not a foreigner. He was working class, just like them. Not the model minority, not wealthy. This was mistaken identity twice over. Wrong ethnicity, wrong citizenship, and using a baseball bat they had in the trunk of their car, they bludgeoned him to death. They literally cracked his skull open so that with blood and spinal fluid and cerebral matter pulling onto the pavement beneath him, he uttered the last words, it's not fair. The uh, EMT who showed up on the scene said, nobody survives a head wound like that. And a few days later, having never regained consciousness, his family uh, ordered that the ventilator be stopped, and he died of the mortal wounds inflicted upon him. Why? Not for anything he had done, but because of his identity, because even though he was Chinese-American, he was a symbol of Toyota and Tokyo. That's the perpetual foreigner syndrome. Um, there's more to this story. The killers, I, I want to emphasize, they always admitted they did what they did. They never for a moment denied it. They couldn't. There were dozens of witnesses to this brutal beating. But they said they were not bigots. This was just a bar brawl that had gotten out of hand. They were sentenced to probation for three years and a fine of $3,000 each. That case, I, I didn't know Chin, but I, I knew that could have been me in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was about a decade older. That's what made me determined to stand up and, and speak out. That's the perpetual foreigner syndrome. That's what happens. Despite the sacrifice of life and limb, I, I wanted to include some of these images here. Uh, this is uh, the late Senator Daniel Inouye, one of the longest uh, serving uh, public servants ever, with uh, JFK. Look at the sleeve of his suit. There's not anything wrong with the tailoring. The right sleeve is empty because he was a soldier for the United States. The Japanese-American segregated units, the 442nd and the 100th, were the most highly decorated U.S. military forces in history. Charging a Nazi bunker uh, to save uh, his uh, fellow Japanese-American soldiers, um, he lost his arm. These are the Filipino veterans who were promised citizenship for themselves and their families. They're receiving the Congressional Gold Medal. They had to fight for decades in order for the promise uh, to be realized. There were Asian American women. This is one of two uh, Asian American aviators in the Army Air Force during World War II. Asian Americans fought in Vietnam, uh, even though they risked friendly fire. 
being mistaken for the enemy. This is Tammy Duckworth, uh, currently a senator from Illinois. When she spoke about uh, her family having been in the United States military for 13 generations, being with George Washington at Valley Forge when she ran for office, she, she lost her uh, legs uh, in the Persian Gulf. Her opponent mocked her and said that he didn't know that there were Asians there uh, during the colonial era and the Revolutionary War. Well, Tammy Duckworth is mixed. She's Anglo-Asian. On her mother's side, she's Thai Chinese. So despite the sacrifice of life and limb, Asian Americans so often are portrayed as not American, not equal. Uh-oh, I just turned the slideshow off. Uh, let's, there we go. I uh, now want to talk a little bit about diversity within diversity. It's so important to acknowledge this. Uh, South Asians, Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asian refugees, and I don't do nearly enough in this talk, and I apologize for that, um, to talk about how Asian American has been constructed. Sometimes people say, well, it's an artificial identity, and I agree, in the best sense. It's a way to build bridges. Because it isn't just that there aren't Asians in Asia. The people in Asia fought total wars against one another just a couple generations ago. There is no, no love lost among them. They don't like one another. They're prejudiced against one another. But here, because you so often are told you look alike, you realize that even if your ancestors would have hated the ancestors of other Asians, well, for mutual self-defense and because it's American to form coalitions, to come together in this way, to forge a new identity uh, as uh, so many have done uh, before Asian Americans that uh, it's important. I also want to point out that there are Afro-Asians. There are Asian adoptees. So uh, this is Charles Mingus. He's my uh, favorite uh, jazz performer, the late Charles Mingus. Uh, with his raucous sound. This is his second album, Mingus Dynasty, and he's uh, here in Chinese regalia. You might think, what is this guy doing? Is he making fun of Asians? No, he is Asian. His grandfather was an immigrant from Hong Kong, and so Charles Mingus uh, is paying homage to his own ancestry uh, here. Uh, this album came out in the late 1950s. This woman, you might think, why is she on a chair? Well, she's 13. This is her bat mitzvah. She's adopted. She's Jewish. She's one of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of Asian girls adopted by white families in the United States. Tiger Woods is Asian. Keanu Reeves is Asian. If you saw Always Be My Maybe, right? Um, Ali Wong, when casting that movie, said it was so important uh, to her that all the male leads uh, be Asian, and Keanu Reeves is indeed uh, Anglo-Asian. Um, there are, uh, is tremendous uh, diversity also within in terms of the political viewpoints that Asian Americans have as there's continuing migration. There are those Afro-Asians and Asian Latinos now who are tracing their ancestry. Um, this is the story of Regina Boone. Uh, what a touching story. Her father on his deathbed uh, said to her, um, he was the publisher of one of the leading black newspapers uh, in the South. He said uh, he had a task for her. Find out what happened to your grandfather, his father, for he was Afro-Asian. That's, uh, that's Regina Boone's uh, grandfather. On December 8th, uh, after a Pearl Harbor, he was taken away by government authorities, never to be seen by his family again. Uh, I won't tell you uh, the story, but she set out uh, using, um, she was given a grant, and, and she found out what happened uh, to her uh, Japanese forebear. There is an entire community in California of Punjabi Mexicans uh, due to anti-miscegenation laws. Uh, this is a book by my friend uh, Paul Madison, Finding Samuel Low. Uh, it's about an Afro-Asian family discovering uh, their uh, Chinese roots. Let's talk now, uh, and then uh, we'll take a few questions about the pandemic. You know, something happened. Starting about a year ago, 
people began to notice with viral videos, all these attacks. When I say people began to notice, I mean people who weren't of Asian descent. Asian Americans have long known about the cases from the 19th century, about Vincent Chin. This violence is not new, but awareness of it is new. And when people first started to see the newspaper headlines and the videos, you probably had conversations with your coworkers as I did with mine. Isn't this random? How do you know this is about race? You know, isn't this, these are just crazy people attacking folks. Everyone's under stress with COVID. So this fellow, his face was slashed with a box cutter. He's permanently scarred. He said nobody came. Nobody helped him. This is, this is the infamous video. If you haven't seen it, I cannot commend it to you. It's just brutal. This is a Filipino woman She's lying on the ground. She'd go to the hospital in critical condition. Some died. This fellow knocked her down. She was on her way to church. Started to kick her in the head. It's about a 30 second video that's captured by the, the footage from the building. That's not the shocking part. That's brutal, it's terrible. The shocking part is there are two burly doormen here. And as you watch the entire video, you realize they've been watching the attack. They stood there. In the final two seconds, you know what they do? They go over and they close the door. They don't help the woman, they close the door, they turn around, they go back to their post. Uh, this is another one of these images. People were, were shouted at, that's how it begins. Go back to where you came from. Those racial slurs that we know well, that are part of the common cruelty of childhood, the teasing and taunting, you still hear that, even in Flushing, when you walk down the street, every now and then someone rolls down their window, right? And then some were spit upon. And in some of these cases, you just try to stare straight ahead and, and you keep walking, right? You've been in this situation, some of you. And that, that doesn't sound terrible, you know, someone just shouting at you. It's a big city. But you have to be ready. And unless you've been in that situation, you don't quite have a sense. You always have to be ready. That's not going to stop there. That's going to lead to someone not just shoving you, but shoving you, an elderly woman, down to the ground so hard that your bones are broken, kicking you, kicking you in the head, stabbing you, shooting you, as in Atlanta, where six of the eight victims were Asian women, killing you, shoving you onto the tracks of a subway with an oncoming train so that you were crushed, following your, you to your apartment, stabbing you to death, case after case after case, not properly investigated, not prosecuted. And yes, this gentleman committing the act, he was disturbed. But these two other gentlemen, the witnesses, the doormen, they were not. And that's what's tragic about this. Yes, in one case, maybe it's random, but you, you start to see a pattern. You realize, no, this actually is also racial. They can't all be random. If you are statistically inclined, if you just did the numbers, this can't be random. There wouldn't be this many attacks. And we've seen the surge uh, leading the way along with anti-Semitism, leading the way not in a good sense. Uh, in hate crimes in New York City are the hate crimes against Asian Americans. And gender is a part of this too. The sexualization of Asian women. Uh, this is the little angry Asian girl. Uh, she's a little bit potty mouthed, I'm afraid, but uh, she, she, this is her phrase that sometimes I just get so angry. Yet there's advocacy. There's the Yellow Whistle Project to, to give out whistles. And I'll close on an optimistic note. You know, I'm, I'm given hope. Um, the reason I'm given hope, about a year ago, I was invited to, to speak in downtown Flushing, two and a half miles from here, at a rally. This is before everyone had gotten the vaccine, so didn't feel quite safe to gather in a group, but I, I knew I had to, to be there. And I looked out at the crowd, and when my turn came to, to come up to the podium, I said to them, I've never seen this. I've never seen hundreds of people of Asian descent, young and old, with signs, with banners ready to march, ready to assert themselves, to stand up and speak out for their civil rights. This civic engagement on the part of Asian Americans, and I meant it literally, I, I had never seen a moment like that. But as importantly, at that podium, speaking before me was then Lieutenant Governor, now Governor 
Kathy Hochul, was Senator, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, was our borough president, uh, my friend Donovan Richards. The Reverend Al Sharpton was there. There were people who were white, there were people who were black, there were people who were Jewish, there were people who were Latino, there were people who were gay and lesbian, there were rabbis. There were people of every background, and I can honestly say this too, I don't ever remember a moment when people of all backgrounds like that came to a rally, stood at the podium, leaders, and addressed Asian Americans, and said to them, I am you, you are me, and we're in this together. That is what gives me hope, that my parents, the voyage they took, the sacrifices they made for this next generation, they were not in vain because it would have been unimaginable that someone who looks like me could attain a status such as this. And it's not about me. I know I have to, as kids say, represent that when one of us has made it in this way against the odds, showing that we are not the model minority, we are not the perpetual foreigner, but we are Americans, like other Americans, with the same aspirations, and that we will be part of the body politic, that we wish to contribute to this diverse democracy here because of those ideals. That is what gives me hope. And I continue to be confident that if we work together, but only if we work together, we'll make good on the promise of this great nation. Thank you so very much. I did receive a, a few questions uh, in advance. Uh, I think uh, that I've addressed them. I tried to work them into the talk. I'm happy to take a question or two uh, from the audience here, and thank you for coming out here to beautiful Queens College on a rainy, dreary, icy day. I, I know it wasn't easy to get here, but I hope we've made it worthwhile that this, to participate, to come to events, and. I know we're only now just emerging and feel comfortable coming back out and gathering crowds with people. But this is what America is about. People mixing and mingling with people who don't look like them, whose ancestors came from different shores, but we know that here we have common cause. Doesn't matter what uh, ship you, you came on, we're all in the same boat together now, right? I know I'm borrowing that phrase. So uh, let's uh, see if there's a, a question or two uh, from the audience. Uh, and then for those of us gathered here, I know uh, thanks to CAPS, uh, there'll uh, be a reception. Allow me too to thank our wonderful IT team. Uh, boy, you've worked so hard through the pandemic. My chief of staff, Megan Morwilk, uh, who I'm uh, thrilled uh, has joined me and who has two uh, girls adopted uh, from China, uh, and Sylvia Hernandez, uh, who works so closely uh, with her and with CAPS to put on this event. Uh, let's see if there's just a, a question or, or two from the audience. Uh, George, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> George, you, you picked a hard question for me. You know, something else that's wonderful about Flushing, Queens, when I go downtown, I realize that here, unlike overseas, and perhaps gathered in this room as well, you have people who maybe, if they were overseas, wouldn't see eye to eye. You know, I talked a little bit about diversity within diversity. Uh, and if you're not of Asian descent, or if you're not of Chinese descent, you might not be aware of all the nuances based on, for example, whether you're Mandarin speaking or Cantonese speaking, whether you trace your roots uh, to mainland China or Taiwan or Hong Kong. 
But one of the aspects of Flushing, Queens, and it stands in for all of New York City in this nation, is that uh, there are people who fly different flags uh, in Flushing, um, and yet they get along. Their businesses are side by side, their homes are side by side, they're co-workers, they are neighbors. And so in the United States, uh, in America, we become Americans, we become New Yorkers. And my hope is, uh, that with global conflict, with the ascent of Asia and China in particular, you know, China is characterized as a direct strategic competitor to the United States. Thoughtful, serious people write books about whether the United States and China will uh, go to war. And so it would not surprise me if people were to say to me, which side would you be on? And uh, I will be as clear as I possibly can be. Uh, I'm an American through and through. I was born on these shores. This is my nation. This is my homeland. This is the only nation I could imagine being loyal to. So as there is global conflict, I hope that Asian Americans will be recognized as Americans. And yet I am respectful that not everyone shares my view, that there are those who may have stronger ties overseas, and that's okay. And sometimes it's even within a single family, right? I have cousins in Taiwan. And as a result of uh, everything that happened in 1949, uh, my cousins in Taiwan, uh, they have cousins who have cousins in mainland China. But uh, I asked my father once, you know, we must have some cousins in mainland China, and he said to me, well, you know, he was in touch with a cousin older than him who was still in touch with those cousins, but they lost touch, so we don't have any cousins there anymore, at least not ones that our family is in touch with. Some of you uh, may know what I'm talking about, may have families like that too. So George, my answer is, um, I hope that like other thoughtful Americans will recognize, uh, and I put out a statement about this as soon as Russia invaded the Ukraine, uh, that we live in perilous times and we stand with the people of the Ukraine and with our students and faculty and staff, some of whom came as refugees uh, and some of whom are very deeply personally affected because they have cousins there and this was an unprovoked uh, invasion. As president of Queens College, I, I don't uh, issue foreign policy statements. We don't have a foreign policy stand, but I care deeply about all uh, here who are stakeholders, who are part of this community, and I know that there are many of Ukrainian background. And even if you're not of Ukrainian background, when you look at the events unfolding and you think about uh, the provocations in the world and what might happen, it makes me all the more grateful that I live in a democracy. It makes me all the more grateful that I live in a society that is diverse, that yes, I know we have our differences, we have problems that remain to be addressed, but we have a set of commitments, and that too, the pandemic has made clear, that when I wear a face mask, yes, I'm protecting myself, but I'm protecting you as well, and vice versa. You wear a face mask for yourself and for me. When I get a vaccination. It's not for me alone. It's for my wife. It's for everyone we care about. And so much of what's happening in the world, whether it's climate change or whatever else, no one of us is going to be able to fix that problem. It takes collective action because it's a collective issue. So what's great about this nation is as a diverse democracy, we know we depend on one another. And that's why we came. We've turned ourselves into New Yorkers and Americans while remembering our heritage, uh, maintaining the language and faith in so many instances. So thank you. Thank you again so very much for joining us here at Queens College. And many thanks to CAPS. We'll be adjourning uh, for uh, a reception uh, in the atrium. Thank you so much.